Mark Irvin. Well, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, William Haig, is here. First of all, this report on Israeli television that members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard have been found amongst the dead Hezbollah fighters. What do you make of that? That is potentially a very disturbing development. We've always thought, the whole world has thought, that Hezbollah had close links with Iran. But to actually find Iranian personnel among the Hezbollah fighters, I think that would be the most disturbing development, uh, if confirmed. I mean, we're only talking on the basis of news reports from Israeli television, but if confirmed, then really the United Nations Security Council should be asking for an explanation from the Iranian government and I would expect the Foreign Secretary in this country to ask for an explanation from the Iranian ambassador. A further disturbing development in terms of the negotiations at any rate was the Israeli cabinet's decision to vote to step up the ground war. Would you describe that as disproportionate? Uh, no, I don't think you can expect Israel to accept a ceasefire unless there is some solution to the whole thing here. After all, they were attacked by Hezbollah, and unless they have some prospect of getting their kidnapped soldiers returned and end to all these rocket attacks on northern Israel, and some hope that Lebanon will have a different future from its immediate past, and then it's unrealistic to expect Israel to sign a ceasefire. I've criticized them for other things that I said were disproportionate, attacking the civil infrastructure of Lebanon and Christian areas of Beirut that appear to be unrelated to the conflict. But I don't think you can criticize the Israelis for refusing to accept a ceasefire until there is some sustainable ceasefire. Are you sure you're not just rowing back from this very highly charged word disproportionate because you've come under a lot of criticism from within your own party? I mean, Stanley Calm's big Tory donor called you an ignorant armchair critic and said that some of your remarks were dangerous about well, this. Well, you know, all of those of us who shape our policies and this have been to Israel many times and are very very familiar with the issues, so we're not ignorant. People do get emotional about this on all sides of the argument, and I think those sorts of comments are a reflection of that. And I don't row back from those comments at all, by the way. I do think that elements of the Israeli action, as I put it in the House of Commons three weeks ago, were disproportionate but, in attacking factories that were not related to the war, uh, Lebanese army units, and so on. However, I've also always been very clear that here you've got to get a sustainable ceasefire, not just but an unconditional one. how can you have a sustainable one. ceasefire if they're actually saying we're escalating the war on the ground while negotiations are going on at the United Nations to try and get a resolution well, on this? we could all argue, couldn't we, about who is escalating it. You know, the Israelis can say, well, Hezbollah are launching hundreds of rockets every day into northern Israel. Hezbollah can say the Israelis are expanding their operations. There is a war going on and all sides are escalating it in one, sort, one way or another. The question is what can we do about it? And I think there is an important British role here. If there is a disagreement, as there evidently is, between America and France at the Security Council, there is a vital role for British diplomacy in attempting to bring France and the United States closer together and to persuade the government of well, Lebanon that, that exactly it may be a mistake. Isn't that what Tony Blair to... is probably trying to well, do? Well, I'm sure he is, and I, and I hope he is, but it is something on which their efforts now need to be redoubled because there was great hope last week that this, that this had been successfully brought almost to a conclusion and clearly it hasn't. It's a great shame, I think, that Lebanon did not accept the, the resolution that, was, that had been satisfied, that was satisfactory to the rest of the international community. Are you stung by the criticism that actually most of the opposition to the government's position seems to be from within its own party? We had the resignation of a, a PPS this evening, that people say that you've been on the, on the sidelines. In fact, all that David Cameron's been talking about are showers for people to cycle to work rather than this enormous crisis which has been raging for more than a month now. No, no David Cameron was talking, gave an interview with the BBC about this just a few days ago, and I've had a whole series of articles and speeches about it, but it's not our purpose to provide opposition for the sake of it on any subject, but particularly on this subject. This is a subject where there will be disagreements uh, across and within political parties. I think that is inevitable. So but we have to say, what can we do in this country? OK, well, specifically, what would you have done differently from Tony Blair? We would have liked, as we said at the time, to have from the G8 summit a greater international coordinated effort to get the diplomacy going on this, which I think was very slow to start. And we see now some of the consequences of it being very slow because it takes such a long time. And I think that was really lacking in the G8 summit. And I think the government should have been franker with the government of Israel about some of the actions, the ones that I've been talking about at the beginning. But I support the government but in saying... saying that publicly, couldn't that have been counterproductive? 
productive? No, I don't think so. I think we are entitled to be a candid friend. But I support what the government are doing in saying this ceasefire, when we get to it, has got to be a sustainable one with some solution to the problem, not just an unconditional one that leaves Israel in the same position as now. And finally, what kind of role do you see for Parliament in this? Do you support up to 100 Labour MPs who are calling for a recall of Parliament? I don't think we've reached that point yet. Uh, I think the danger in having a recall of Parliament now, we're, in a long, we're at the beginning of a long recess, is if we had a recall now and this situation got worse over the next month, then people would say, oh, you can't have another recall in a month's time. So I don't think we're yet at the point of, of asking for a recall of Parliament. Certainly we're not at that point yet. And I think other people should stay their hand for a little while. William Haig, many thanks. Thank you.